Let me tell you a story about horse girls. But first off, thank you for 2,000 subscribers. Yes, I'm in a different shirt. Yes, there's a poster behind me. Yes, the background changed. That's because I'm filming this later. I filmed the original at a very low energy and it really sucked. It really did not get across that I was excited about this. It was like, oh, thanks for 2,000 subscribers. Shut up, old Tony. As I'm filming this right now, we haven't hit it yet, but we're really close to it. If we are at 2,000 subscribers, thank you. If we aren't, pretend. Okay, thanks. So if you haven't seen my update video, I'm currently working on a really long video that's taking forever to finish. It's good, I promise. However, it's taking forever. So in the meantime, I needed a smaller video to tide everyone over with, but unfortunately, like everything I cover, I found a magical twist. And you know me, we pick very niche movies over here. So in my quest to find something small to cover, my sister, who is a resident horse girl, recommended a film that was best left forgotten, which led me to The Derby Stallion, a 2005 not classic starring Zac Efron as a boy who doesn't want to play baseball and would much rather be riding horses and Bill Cobbs as an alcoholic, which was enough to sell me on this movie. <laughs> but that wasn't the only magical stuff we found at the beginning. I was more so convinced by the poster to give this movie a shot because look at this, oh my God. I showed this to my friend Charlie and he pointed out that the alt posters are just the exact same photo, but like they went through the face app filter and made him smile in one. <laughs> I remember showing this poster to my friend El Ultimo TV Nata and he said that the poster and tagline makes it look like a movie where Zac Efron turns into a horse, which would be an objectively better movie. <laughs> so this movie was locked in for a video and I just needed a way to watch it. it sounds easy enough, right? No. In my quest to find this movie to cover and review it, we went through my grandma's old movie collection because my sister remembers us watching the movie as kids, but alas, it must have gotten lost when they moved. That should be alright though, this movie is probably on Disney Plus or even Netflix or something, right? No. No streaming platform has this movie. <laughs> okay, then maybe this movie is on an illegal pirating platform, which I do not use that is illegal. That should cover my ass. But as we started trying to find any link to this movie, we couldn't. It doesn't exist. Zac Efron himself destroyed any streaming link to this movie. <laughs> However, it's not like we couldn't find anything for this movie, right? However, the links we could find for this movie led us in a route I couldn't even use. It was a 240p quality movie with a German dub. Yeah, Zac Efron is speaking German in Russian subtitles. <laughs> Which I'm not convinced Zac Efron speaks either. Oh, the boy, which fuck it? Namigos. Nam, namigos. Or fragmented clips on YouTube in 240p max quality. I haven't seen this movie before. I don't know how to stitch them together. So I was feeling stressed. However, I found a saving grace. An Amazon link to the movie where I could rent it for two euros. Amazon.co.uk <laughs> Which didn't work, of course, because it's a European link and I live in Georgia right now. So I tried buying it. Of course, it didn't work because I'm in America. And I reached out to customer service to ask if there was any way I could get around this, if a VPN could help me. And they were like, nah, I don't know, but you can try it, but I don't promise anything. So I was like, all right. <laughs> so I turned on a VPN because that's what they recommended. That didn't work either. <laughs> okay, last case scenario. I see there are gift cards that you can use to buy stuff. And if I buy an Amazon gift card of three euros, cause I know there's gonna be tax, maybe I'll be able to rent it. So I bought the three euro gift card. I went back giggling and I went to go buy it and it blocked me. <laughs> I can't buy it at all. So I now have a three euro gift card that I cannot use. So if anyone is from Europe and needs anything, you're looking at your sugar daddy. <laughs> so I had to swallow my pride and buy the $3 CD off of Amazon and wait two weeks for it to ship. Because if I tried doing prime delivery, it would only show up like a day earlier and that would be an extra $10 and I don't need it that badly. And now that it's shipped and I've spent $12 total on this. Oh, by the way, this is the special edition and this was the last one you could buy. So... <laughs> Sorry, Zac Efron. And after all the pain I went through and I finally can hold it in my hand, I can safely say, $12 is a little too much. <laughs> so after the most amount of hurdles I've ever gone through in my entire life to cover something on this channel, I give to you the Derby Stallion, the Zac Efron horse girl movie that should be shot. This movie is an acid trip. We open up on grainy old footage that's somehow at like 70 FPS where Zac Efron and Bill Cobbs talk to each other over music that is way louder than both of them and do the biggest exposition dump a movie could ever have. Bill Cobbs plays Houston Jones, a man first seen in a newspaper seen at 50% opacity. And Zac Efron plays Patrick McCurdle, a kid who's skipping baseball practice to talk to the town's alcoholic. Now through the hardly audible dialogue, we learn that Houston Jones raced in a derby once and won that one time. McCurdle keeps asking why he only raced once and Houston keeps answering that he did it to keep a promise, but he doesn't say what that promise is, but we'll learn later. <laughs> we also learn of Houston's alcoholism, and we can determine from this face that McCurdle is not approving of this. The scene ends with Houston playing his harmonica, and it transitions into the next scene, and you're going to slowly realize how beautiful the transitions with music are. Come on, guys, come on. <laughs> 
going to point out why the soundtrack is so morbidly hilarious later, but until then, just enjoy how raw it sounds. We learn that this is the third time McCurdle, or as a bully calls him later, Curdle skipped practice, and it's because he doesn't like baseball, and instead he wants to ride horsies. The plot of this movie is literally, I'm living your dream, Dad, not mine. I love the cuts between everything else going on in the world that's way more interesting. This happens at least like 10 times in this film. So in one of the things we cut to that's way more interesting, we get to see two 15 year olds and a rogue seven year old on ATVs just hauling down the street. <laughs> they commit a crime to establish that they are bad people. And in the meantime, we cut to Patrick. I don't want to call him Curdle anymore. Uh, venting about how his dad would freak out if he quit baseball because his dad used to play in the majors. Now what team did he play for you ask? The Cleveland Indians. That's the team from my state. <laughs> I know I said Georgia earlier, but if you don't know, I'm from Ohio. I'll also say the Ohio National Anthem while we're here. Ohio, not the worst state, but we're up there. And I know for a fact, Patrick's dad would have some choice words about the new name change. <laughs> I really like what I think is a joke here. Besides, he'd blow a gasket if I quit. <laughs> you make him sound like my tractor. <laughs> Even Houston was like, yeah, that made no sense, dude. No horses like me. Oh boy. I love the transition out of this scene. <laughs> that felt real. Yeah, so the main bully Randy and Discount Mitchell Musso are currently decimating Houston's tomatoes that he leaves out for the town for no other reason than to establish that they are terrible people. I also learned when I did a watch party for this film in my Discord. By the way, join my Discord. It's in the link below. And that someone pointed out that the rogue seven-year-old named Chuck is actually Coconut Head from Ned's Declassified. So this film could be seen as a prequel to not only Ned's Declassified, but also High School Musical. <laughs> After he won the derby, he's like, I'm gonna go play basketball. <laughs> I love how in this scene, Coconut Head, who is clearly like the new kid, just yelling at Randy and Mitchell Musso to stop doing this. It's like, come on guys, come on, that's not cool. Come on. He's just saying that stuff the entire time they're destroying these tomatoes and actually robbing this dude. Can you imagine this in a hostage situation? Oh, uh, come on guys, not cool. Uh, put that gun down, not cool. Chuck, which is Coconut Head's actual name, tries defending Houston Jones from Randy's slander, and Randy takes offense to this kid calling a previous winner of the steeplechase the champion. You want a champion? I'm it. My man Randy here is the fastest steeplechase rider in the county in the state. Jesus Christ, calm down, dude. Houston has not entered the race. He's like 70, you are 15, calm down. <laughs> Anyways, after Randy starts colloding, they see Patrick walking away from Houston's place and Chuck starts pogging. His dad played in the majors. A couple seasons with the Indians, it don't mean diddly. Oh, it's personal now, you 30 year old looking motherfucker. So Patrick is reasonably upset that these two troubled adolescents just destroyed this poor dude's produce for seemingly no reason. And this harrowing fight breaks out. Viewer discretion is advised. What'd you guys do this for? Hey. Whatever happened to hot? Spastic Patrick gets right to the point. <laughs> Spastic Patrick. Hey guys, chill out. Oh my God. He literally just said, what'd you guys do this for? And like barely, not even like barely, he like lightly pushed you away. Barely just being like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and Mitchell Musso goes, whatever happened to High? Like he didn't just commit a crime. Freeze, you're under arrest. Oh, uh, whatever happened to High? What? A little common courtesy goes a long way. Dude, you put a pipe bomb in a preschool. So the entire time this scene was going on, someone in my Discord started saying that this entire movie reads better as Patrick's coming out story because of the pure, gonna be frank, sexual tension between these two in this scene. So nothing comes of these two actually committing a crime and Patrick bikes home, literally chucking his bike to the ground, which he does in every scene. Over dinner, Patrick's dad asks him why he wasn't at baseball practice and Patrick avoids the question by saying, around. Patrick's dad presses further since this is the third time he's missed practice. And Patrick responds with this. What is this, the Inquisition? Don't Which is one of the best lines in this movie. <laughs> Later, Patrick's mom wants to talk to him in his room, and Patrick can't understand why his family is so against him hanging out with Houston Jones. Now, while I completely get it from his perspective, I'm also getting it from his parents' perspective because, you know, he's a 70-year-old man and you're 15. <laughs> his mom says that Houston is not a good influence on him, and Patrick disputes that by saying that she doesn't even know him. How could she possibly know what he's like? And this gives us one of the best lines in the entire movie. It's because he's black, isn't it? No, it's not. Well, then what? <laughs> I love how he treated this like it was his ace in the hole. And then when she said it wasn't because he was black, he was so flabbergasted. And he was like, I have literally no other idea what this could be. <laughs> 
Patrick's mom reveals that Houston has a problem with alcohol, and that's why they're all concerned of him befriending Houston. And Patrick responds like a little Ben Shapiro. You always tell me not to judge until I have the facts, right? Well, what are you doing right now? You're judging someone you don't even know. The scene also ends in the weirdest possible way. It'd be so awful for you to spend some time with some kids that are your own age. No. So after this momentous scene, we cut to Patrick playing baseball and absolutely killing it. I love the range of kids on this team because they'll have kids who are like 17 to 19 years old to 27. And then this actual seven year old on the team. What is the age range for this team? Oh my God. I love how these two dudes clap in the exact same way and leave in the exact same way. So as Patrick goes up to bat, this woman who is totally not the love interest randomly shows up in varying frame rates and then distracts him long enough to get him beamed in the head. So we get a scene of Randy hitting on this girl and she's not caring for it. But the main draw of this scene for me is the extras because like Drew Gooden says, there will always be someone who looks right into the camera and luckily for us that is like every extra in this scene <laughs> this girl on the right keeps staring into it I, I swear to god it looks like she's just this grandma in the top middle keeps smirking the entire time hell even mitchell muso breaks during this scene i'm sure he has a name but i'm not fact checking so we cut to another scene of exposition with houston and patrick but the entire time there was this blaring train horn in the back and we never see a train this entire movie when i'm showing this to people for the first time they always think huh is the train near me going on <laughs> However, the main draw of the scene is we learn the whole past of Houston Jones and why he raced only one time. The love of his life is a girl named Julie Juliet, which I don't think you could make a faker name if you even tried. We get a glimpse into why Houston doesn't ride horses anymore, despite winning the Derby Cup once. As a young man, he fell for a white woman in the same drip as the evil girlfriend from Get Out. In this flashback, she keeps saying that she's going to tell her father that they're going to get married. And Houston's are like, these are the old times. That won't end well. And she's like, I'm going to single-handedly end racism. And she rides off before he can stop her. And like any good horse girl movie, she falls off and dies. R.I.P. Julie. <laughs> we lost a real one. Houston offhandedly implies that they blamed him for her death since he was the last one who saw her and that led to him, quote, picking up the drink. So it's just implied that everyone assumes he's a murderer, I guess. <laughs> and then he does this. We don't give a f After this revelation of why no one trusts Houston, Patrick asks if Houston could train him to ride horses. <laughs> I'm married to Dr. Phil. Patrick chucks his poor bike again. And Patrick tells his parents that he has made a decision and wants to quit baseball to ride horses. After an argument I don't care enough to write jokes about, Patrick's dad gives him an ultimate made him where he'll give him two months to enter the steeplechase to justify him quitting baseball. This scene ends with the first of a few great ADRs. Thanks. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So Patrick goes to Houston to tell him the good news, but I don't know how to explain it, but this looks like a stage performance. So Patrick and Houston go on a trip to the next scene and we get the best music ever put to film. So now that we're in a scene with a cameo from the man himself, I finally want to point out that the music for this film was composed by Billy Preston. For those who don't know, Billy Preston was a legendary musician who worked with the Beatles. He was the first ever musical guest on Saturday Night Live and had a long, lengthy, admirable career. And this was his swan song. He originally was gonna play the role of Houston Jones himself, but his health made him unable to fill in at the time. So they still had him cameo in the film, which was cool. However, God, this music is not good. So Will Gentry, a man who never shows up again in the film, gives Patrick a new horse named Rusty that costed about $5,000 and has quote, So if we're taking this film of Houston trying to live on his legacy through Patrick, we can deduce that from this line that Patrick's love interest is going to die later in the film, and then Patrick's going to be like, I promised her. <laughs> so part of the deal with Houston training Patrick to ride horses is that Patrick does whatever Houston says, no questions asked. So we get a scene of Patrick shoveling the horse's doo-doo feces, and when he's done, Houston tells him to go home as they're done for the day. I get he's doing this to establish a bond between Patrick and the horse, but dude, the steeplechase is in two months and he's never ridden before. Oh my God, is this the only thing these two losers do? <laughs> Patrick's had enough to the point that he chucks his bike again. So of course, Patrick confronts Randy and my Discord was going feral over this scene. You want me to kick your butt? Because I can do that. Can try. Anyways, Chuck's sister and girl who has unfortunately been marked for death shows up to save the day. Randy and Mitchell ditch town, and once again, nothing of note comes of this. And then we get one of the best lines ever written. Mom, Annie's telling lies and farting. 
Aaron Sorkin, you will never have what this movie has. <laughs> Anyways, it's been at least two weeks and Patrick has still not ridden this stupid horse. But everyone comes over for a barbecue with some of the driest ribs I've ever seen in my entire life. And his family finally gets to see Patrick training the horse, which consists of him literally spinning in a circle. Wouldn't I learn better if I was on him? I mean, this is justified from Patrick. There's literally a month until the derby and he still hasn't touched this stupid horse. And Houston has the audacity to say this. Then you couldn't see. What? Unless you got x-ray vision, you can't see through the horse when you're riding him. What does that mean? Do the horse blinders go on Patrick too? So Patrick keeps telling Houston he's ready and Houston keeps telling him that Patrick rides by his rules and Patrick responds with this. And what's the use? All I do is exercise him, clean up after him and, and feed him. He had to ride me. It seems Patrick is trying to go for a Mr. Hand situation. Uh, so Patrick goes to leave and the horse actually follows him, which means that the horse trusts him and this scene happens. It means you're ready to ride. Finally. Your top five films will never come even close to this film. So Patrick finally gets to ride his horse, Rusty, and Houston doesn't even give him a block to stand on, so he falls like an idiot. So Houston finally teaches Patrick how to ride, and this happens. Tell him to walk. Start there. All right. Rusty, walk. Whoa. There's a literal montage of him falling off of this horse, which is hilarious because this is like a few weeks before the derby begins. Patrick's dad is cheering for a stunt double. This scene is a fever dream where we see shots of Patrick riding the horse and a different horse is jumping on a completely different course. They're like not even similar locations, so that's why we never see this in a wide. And I know this is a fever dream because this is my third time watching this movie and this is the first time I'm seeing this scene. So there are three things consistent in life, death, taxes, and these two losers destroying Houston's tomatoes. These kids attempt to gaslight Houston and to try and convince them that he destroyed these tomatoes, even though there are at least eight different witnesses that can testify against them. So after Houston tells Randy that he's gonna be a good for nothing freeloader when he's older, Randy says this. Run your last race, old man. As we get a weird POV shot of Houston having a heart attack, but we can determine that Houston will listen to Joe Rogan as he refuses medical help as he's quote fine. So after Houston refuses medical care and says that his dog is better than any doctor he knows, he brings Patrick to the steeplechase arena to practice and this shot happens. Go! What's even better than that is this interaction between Houston and this dude who's timing them. Thanks for wasting my time. I sure wish you would let me waste just a little bit more of it. Is this a little? I don't know what this means. Luckily, Patrick qualifies for the steeplechase by two hundredths of a second, and that doesn't matter because we get another musical transition that is neither Bill Cobbs or Zac Efron. Those are two dolls. <laughs> so now that Houston has passed his gift of horse training onto Patrick, and Patrick has qualified for the steeplechase, it's time to die. So Patrick and girl, who I still have literally no idea what her name is, find Houston dead. They have an emotional scene, and just kidding, I laugh every time I see this because the train horn is still in the back, and it's in the same key as the soundtrack. Anyways, Patrick is hung up on the fact that Houston was all alone when he died, and his dad. Dad says this. The way it is. We go out the way we come in. You were literally at least with one other person when you were born, your mother. Houston did not just pop into existence, dad. So now that Houston is dead, Patrick no longer wants to do the derby, which makes sense. The derby is only a few days away and he just literally started learning how to ride two weeks ago. So as every character in this film tries to convince him to join the derby again, my sister brought up a great point, which is, did Houston leave a will? <laughs> he knew very well that he was gonna die and it seems that there was no will left behind. So these horses are gonna be foreclosed and legally owned by the state, AKA they are not yours. So from the government, fuck you, Patrick. <laughs> well, after that threatening letter from the government, Jill, I finally found out her name, finds a letter to Patrick that Houston wrote just before he died. He also learned that he died April 7th, my mom's birthday. Happy birthday, mom. Patrick reads the letter and discovers that they were his racing silks, which were a prized possession of his. So Patrick is convinced to enter the derby. Yay, but unfortunately, this would not happen in real life because the derby is literally starting in an hour and he said he quit. He withdrew. They're not going to let him in right before the race starts. Anyways, Patrick finishes reading the letter. Love, Houston. Me too. Patrick didn't say any of that letter out loud and she managed to perfectly time the me too. What? So their truck won't start because Randy sabotaged it, which doesn't matter at all, although it gives us this scene. This is not good. I've seen good before and this is definitely not it. We're screwed. 
Lewd and tattooed. Shut, Shut up, Chuck. What did he do? Anyways, the dad drives this car that's apparently on fire and fixes their truck as the horses are loading onto the track. He can't re-enter the race at this point. He quit the race. Stop kissing. He's going to be late. Patrick miraculously makes it on time and re-enters the race with 30 seconds to post. How is he allowed to race? Anyways, forget logic for a second. You guys ready for the least climactic ending ever put to film? This steeplechase has hyped up the entire movie, and I'm not exaggerating. It is under three minutes long. We are an hour and 30 into the film, <laughs> building up to this steeplechase that is only like two minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> There's like no tension at all in the steeplechase. Although I'll point out some highlights. Randy does this move that would get him DQ'd in a real race. Patrick says this and he sounds like an anime character. Let's go boy, this is our shot. And he wins. I'm not exaggerating. This ending is just barely over two minutes long. I remember the first time I watched this with my sister, I legitimately asked, is the film over? <laughs> Luckily, there's still some gold at the end of this mine shaft. Like for instance, as Patrick gets the trophy for winning, we see this girl in a Confederate flag shirt who's just staring into Patrick's soul the entire time. Patrick visits Houston's grave and leaves the trophy there, which is definitely gonna get grave robbed. And this movie ends with the pan out of Houston's grave as one of the daughters mutters the single greatest final line ever put to film. This was worth $3 on Amazon. <laughs> so because I felt fun and flirty, and this was the only version of the CD I could physically get my hands on, I got the special edition for $3. And believe me, I got my money's worth because there are a ton of bonus features, baby. In the special edition, we get some exclusive CD content, which I will go through with you right now. There's some bonus features of interviews with the cast, an exclusive interview with Zac Efron in the loudest room ever. It's fun. And some rather unfortunate songs from Billy Preston. Let's enjoy some of the bonus ROM content that the CD provided. We got some printable photos, which are just photos of Zac Efron looking so sick. We get wallpapers, which are just this wonderful poster stretched to be a wallpaper. And you bet your sweet ass this is now my computer background. We also have what they called buddy icons, which are 48 by 48 pixel wide GIFs of different shots of Zac Efron and the Derby Stallion, which you can make your profile pics on Discord, which is what my friends and I did. <laughs> and lastly, a screensaver which looks like this after you set it up. Man, I'm having such a good time looking at this horse, but you know, my other favorite thing is Zac Efron, but Zac's not here, so I'm only getting half of my favorite things. If only Zac Efron would show up and really surprise me with a golden opportunity. If you watch this video in its entirety, you are part of something special because like I said, you can't watch this movie anywhere else. There's no streaming platforms. There's no real pirate link unless you speak German and Russian. So this is the only way to experience it without buying it. And I don't even know if there's any more copies available. I didn't cover everything in this movie because there's so much to cover. However, there's a lot of stuff that also I didn't bother to cover, like how bad these two daughters are. And they're the real life daughters of the mom. Even though there's some boring parts, I still love this movie. And I'm going to start doing this with everything I cover because I think it's fun. I'm going to start tier listing my enjoyment on everything. To quickly explain what my tiers are, I enjoy everything I cover. Otherwise, I wouldn't cover it. But my lowest rank is D. Let me explain. D is for stuff that I think is fun, but was kind of a log to get through. C is for my baseline enjoyment. I got exactly what I expected out of it. B is for stuff that exceeded my expectations. I enjoyed my time with it. A is for stuff that dominates my life for the amount of time I cover it. Stuff that I genuinely believe are ironic masterpieces. And S is for stuff of legend. Well, so far, only Rhapsody is there, but I would love to add more stuff to this later as I continue to cover stuff. So with all my tears explained, I'm going to give the Derby Stallion a respectful B. It's really bad and hilarious, and I think the reason I love it so much is because I had to move heaven and earth to get this, but I still think this is a great movie to watch and laugh at if you can even get your hands on it, so it gets a B. And with that, thanks for watching. Please hit that subscribe button to help me on my quest to go from underrated to just rated. And while you're at it, don't forget to politely press that like button as it's been smashed too many times. If you enjoyed this video, I have plenty of others you'll enjoy. I also have my debut album, Affiliate, coming out later this year. But until then, I'll see you all later. Bye.